thank you for inviting me here and we have a very young audience today so hopefully we will be able to give some impressions which you can carry forward in your uh, work life and in your further career so what we have been hearing is the about the respiratory pathogens like uh, i'm basically an infectious disease person so apart from the non communicable disease that ails lungs there is also a huge burden of respiratory pathogens in our country and these have pandemic potential that is why we are worried about them as we saw with covid-19 how it com uh, completely devastated the whole of the country and we are still having some lingering effect in terms of dyspnea in terms of uh, fatigue etc but covid-19 did teach us a lot of things uh, i'll mainly focus my talk as to how it impacted clinical research because a lot of these advancements that we talk about need to be backed by evidence and that is where our uh, job comes in to generate that evidence so that uh, the policy makers the government is confident enough to actually implement those on a large scale so what we saw uh, during covid-19 we had a very unusual situation where initially the country was in lockdown there was problem in movement and even after that in clinical research the most important uh, point is the patient is the participant so uh, we did find that during covid there was a huge reluctance to participate in clinical research partly because people were wary in coming to hospitals in actually visiting any healthcare facility and they were right to be worried about it and so it was difficult to recruit people and as such all the hospitals were overburdened at that point all healthcare workers were taking care of patients in any form so it was very difficult to get people to work for research but at the same time it was important that we generate evidence because it was a complete new disease which we did not know anything about unless we have evidence it was all empirical treatment so uh, so we were facing a very very unique situation where usually where we do a trial we do a clinical research it takes its own you know sweet time to get the, to get the preparations done to get the approvals done and then the study done but here we were all racing against time so that we have to get it done in a very fast forward uh, way and we had to get answers before the whole thing became combustive so so what we actually found was since we did not have answers there were so many studies taking place like if you go to the clinical trial registry of india i'm sure you're aware of ctr right there's a registry where you have you can you can and you have to register all your trials before you start them so that is a very good uh, resource where you can know what are the types of studies that are being taken undertaken in the country so what we what you can see is that there were multiple single center studies because everybody was looking for answers and they were taking up resource in both terms of money in terms of manpower but then if you have smaller studies and multiple of them not well designed they were not actually providing the answers that people were looking for so this led to the uh, you know discussion around the globe regarding research waste or inefficiency of research as we are calling it in which in all good intention everybody is doing studies but they are so fragmented or in silos that they are not actually leading to anything conclusive any definite answers so uh, what are the lessons that we learned from this whole scenario one is that we need to reduce this inefficiency and for that we need to have more multi site collaborative studies and we did see that in times of emergency collaborations do happen there was a lot of data sharing technology transfer uh, you know not only amongst national institutes national bodies but also amongst international institutes and international bodies and that is how people could come up with vaccines could come up with some definitive treatment 
So if we could do it during emergencies, during a pandemic, why can't we do it during the other times as well? So that is why we need well-designed collaborative studies, which would be representative of a larger population, which will be more definitive in its question and will answer the question that we are asking. And we don't need to repeat the same study again and again. They have to be well-designed, with uh, conducted with rigor. So this is what everybody understood. And another important thing that we understood is that there is a need for ready networks, re need for ready centers, which know how to do these studies. And they can be, uh, you know, they can be uh, incorporated in any study as and when needed. Because if you start from scratch, try to train people as to how to do it, it's going to take time. But in a situation where you need answers easily and quickly, trial networks are a boom. So that is something that we realized we lack in our country. Uh, each of our senior researchers might have their own network of people with whom they do work all the time, but there is no such official, there is no such uh, network which is there and which is being trained, capacity building is being done, and which can be utilized in terms of pandemic. And as you know, we also learned that we need some kind of newer designs to do our study, which can be done faster. We need master protocols. We need new approaches. If you have been doing clinical research, you would be aware that there's a lot of things like monitoring and visits and a lot of paperwork and consent. All these are involved. Uh, in terms of in times of the pandemic, in terms of these monitoring, a lot of innovative ways were used. Like we were having um, VCs to in order to monitor. Remote monitoring became a thing, and it was very efficiently used by all investigators. As the patients did not want to come to the hospital, they did not want to follow up with healthcare visits. So therefore, uh, video calls or phone visits became the norm where a very elaborate history could be taken from there. E-consent was a norm. And then comes the question of actually building the research ecosystem. Unless you build the research ecosystem in times of peace, it's not going to give you the benefits in times of emergency. So that involves ethics reviews. You, uh, Many of you might be members of ethics committee or you have undergone reviews by the ethics committee. And what we realized is there is still a huge need to sensitize our ethics committee to be able to do the review in a faster manner, in a more comprehensive manner. And Embedding these practices in a routine uh, practice not only elevates the routine clinical practice, but obviously helps us in finding answers. Uh, this we already talked about that we realized a network is needed because that gives us a wider representation, that gives us a way to do faster enrollment and uh, an access to higher number of willing participants and more number of investigators can be involved. Because as we know right now, clinical research in our country is carried out only by a few uh, institutes of national importance, And majority of our studies, our publications, everything comes from these centers. But there's a whole uh, wide array of medical colleges and investigators who have good ideas and who have access to, be, uh, access to the patients who need this, these treatments. So that is what, where a network comes in, and Indian Council of Medical Research has launched this network, which is across the country, which involves more than 40 centers, and it is an over, ever growing network. During COVID, I, like, we did conduct a few studies from which we actually, you know, we could glean these lessons, these barriers that we faced. But still, even during that time, we had these, uh, you know, ways to solve these problems so that we can get proper data. And uh, like I was talk, uh, told to talk about best practices, so we did have some very successful examples of collaborative research across the world. You all have heard about the recovery trial, which gave us the first 
uh, definitive treatment. Like people were using, uh, our clinical colleagues can tell us people were using steroids, but then this gave us evidence that yes, dexamethasone is helpful in people who are requiring the oxygen and ventilatory support. Then we also saw pivoting of already existing collaborations. NIH has a huge network of collaboration, which was uh, which was built during the HIV times, and they pivoted it to in order to answer the COVID questions. So that is another way that we can solve our problems of having uh, centers to do research, ready centers. Recently, WHO has come up with a draft clinical trial guidance, which talks about, again, collaborative research, uh, participatory research, because most of the times we see collaboration from high-income countries where they have a protocol, they come to us, and we're just centers providing them with samples and patients, and we don't have so much of intellectual input in those studies. But then now, uh, people have realized that if you really want to tap into the uh, potentials of all the low resource uh, countries, you have to have more of a participatory discussion rather than just a colonial way of uh, exchanging ideas. And as I said, research ecosystem development is very important and we are working towards it so that we have a more robust ecosystem where interested investigators can do their work properly. Thank you.